the greatest beer run ever. Truth is often stranger than fiction, and sometimes a real-life tale is so outlandish that people are often left to wonder, why hasn't this been made into a movie? This is one of those stories. In November 1967, 26-year-old John Chicky Donahue was having a drink at Doc Fiddler's, a local bar in the Inwood neighborhood of Manhattan, New York. Tending bar was George Lynch, nicknamed the Colonel, though Lynch was only a private first class when he was discharged from the military. Lynch was a vehement patriot who had little tolerance for the growing anti-war movement that was gaining steam as the quagmire of the Vietnam War ground on. That night, Donahue was listening intently to Lynch, demonstrating his dissatisfaction with protest playing out on the TV above the bar. Always willing to show his appreciation for those in uniform, the colonel exclaimed, Somebody ought to go over to Nam, track down our boys from the neighborhood, and bring them each a beer. Lynch's eyes then turned towards Donahue and he said, I want to borrow your seaman's card. Donahue, a former Marine, was a member of the Merchant Marine, civilians tasked with sailing tankers, cargo ships, and other supply vessels, and were vital for logistics in any conflict. When he asked why, Lynch stated that he wanted to bring a beer to every man from the neighborhood serving in Vietnam. Donahue thought Lynch was joking, but it was soon clear that he was not. It was also clear that there was no way Lynch could pass for Donahue, so using his ID card would be pointless, and all other forms of travel to Vietnam were restricted to civilians, for obvious safety reasons. Still, inspired by the colonel's enthusiasm, Donahue decided on a whim to travel to Vietnam himself in order to hand out beer to his old drinking buddies. At that point, 28 Inwood residents had been killed in action. Included in this number was Tommy Minogue, a combat medic and friend of Donahue, who sacrificed his life to protect his commanding officer and help fight off an overwhelming NVA attack on his greatly outnumbered unit. For his actions, he would receive the Congressional Medal of Honor. Inspired by their sacrifice, Donahue wanted to support the others still overseas as best he could. The first challenge was finding where the servicemen were stationed. For security reasons, any correspondence to and from Vietnam was censored, with exact locations omitted. Still, word spread, and family and friends ventured to Doc Fiddlers, giving names of service members along with cryptic references to unit names, as well as slivers of information from letters home, such as places the men had visited. Hey, it's Chris Kane. You're probably used to hearing me during one of our advertising spots, but today I want to talk about something a little bit different. Every video that we create is more than just content. It's a blend of research, of creativity, of passion for history. We do it because we believe in the power of history, because its lessons, its stories, and its ability to connect everybody is what we're all about. Sometimes the reality of operating a YouTube channel uh, presents challenges uh, in the form of demonetization occasionally, which impacts the ability to produce content that we're passionate about. Now we're looking at you, our amazing audience, to ask for your support in keeping the channel, our shared passion, alive and thriving. We're inviting you to join us on Patreon and contribute to the ongoing creation of our content. By joining us on Patreon, you're doing more than just supporting our content. You're becoming an integral part of the community, and we're dedicated to preserving and promoting history. Remember, every bit of support makes a real difference. If you'd like to learn more about how you can help, please visit the link in the description below. Thank you, as always, for your interest and your hunger for history. Now armed with a list of names and an idea of where to look, Donahue next secured passage. This was rather simple, as he was a member of the Merchant Marine and was able to get an assignment on the SS Drake Victory, a World War II-era victory ship, which was being used to haul ammunition. After weeks at sea, the Drake Victory pulled into Queen Yan Harbor. Donahue made it ashore, his duffel bank filled with beer. He made sure to include lesser-known brands that were unlikely to be available in Vietnam such as Pabst Blue Ribbon, Schaefer, 
Peels, and Rheingold. He was planning on spending three days finding the six men he had locations for, before heading back to his ship for the trip home. And it was here that Donahue had a stroke of luck. The ships in the harbor were guarded by military police, one of them being Tommy Collins, who was one of the men on the list. As it turned out, Collins was on duty, ready to be relieved. When Donahue called up to him, Collins did a double take, clearly not expecting his friend to travel to the other side of the planet to deliver a beer. Once the shock wore off, Collins downed the beverage and burst out laughing at the absurdity of it all. The men, along with some of Collins' bunkmates, then spent the rest of the night drinking and reminiscing at a local bar. When their festive attitudes got the attention of an overzealous lieutenant, Donahue told off the officer, who blanched and turned away sheepishly. Apparently, he believed that Donahue, dressed in jeans and a plaid shirt, was working for the CIA and backed off. This civilian clothing would serve him well in the coming weeks. After spending the night at the barracks, Donahue then headed north. As luck would have it, one of the men in the bar that night was a member of the 1st Air Cavalry Division, the same unit as Ricky Dugan, another Inwood resident on the list. The man had no issues bringing a random civilian on the mail run, scheduled for 8 a.m. the next morning. And working through a hangover, Donahue boarded a Grumman Albatross, headed for An K and Bravo Company, 1st Air Cavalry. It was here that Donahue's luck faltered. Bravo Company had left that position and were headed north about 200 miles, towards the demilitarized zone separating North and South Vietnam. Fortunately, there was another mail run scheduled for that new location. The downside was, Donahue only had less than an hour to make the 1300 flight. Picked up by a passing jeep, he explained his mission to the distracted driver when the vehicle came to a screeching halt. The driver was Kevin McLuhan, another man on Donahue's list. Once he overcame the astonishment, Kevin, who was a former Marine and was at the time working as a civilian contractor, enjoyed a can of Rheingold before speeding off towards the airfield. Saying his goodbyes to McLuhan, Donahue then boarded another plane, the crew not questioning why a civilian wanted to travel with them, once again assuming him to be a CIA operative. Landing in Fubai, he then managed to board a Huey, the crew, also believing him to be working for the CIA, headed for the Quang Tri province, near the DMZ. Dugan was at an observation post overlooking the DMZ when his sergeant radioed him to return to the command post. Entering the bunker, he did a double take, clearly not expecting a drinking buddy to show up handing out beers. He and Donahue, along with Dugan's comrades, spent a good portion of the night talking about life back home, but refrained from drinking since the enemy was so close at hand. That very night, their positions were hit by NVA infiltrators, and Donahue did his best to keep his head down, and even joined the men on a patrol the next day. The day after that, he boarded a CH-47 Chinook, which dropped him off near Quang Tri Airfield. After a series of misadventures, Donahue made his way back to Queen Yan, where, to his horror, he found that his ship had departed without him. The captain had heard rumors of an expected VC attack and expedited the unloading process before sailing off. In desperation, Donahue then headed towards Saigon, begging, bluffing, and doing whatever he could for transit. Once he reached the embassy, he battled the bureaucratic nightmare of being a civilian in a war zone without a passport, military orders, or any other official documentation. While waiting for his paperwork to clear, Donahue celebrated the Vietnamese holiday of Tet in the downtown district of the city. The festive atmosphere was interrupted by the Tet Offensive, a massive coordinated strike against South Vietnamese and American installations by VC and NVA forces, and the primary target was the capital city of Saigon. Soon, the entire city erupted in intense fighting, and Donahue, an unarmed civilian, was caught in the middle of it. He spent the offensive doing everything he could to avoid getting caught in the crossfire of the VC sappers and American military, who were desperately trying to fight them off. After a few days, the fighting slackened, and with his travel plans now on hold, Donahue was able to find the location of another man on his list. 
Bobby Pappas was a communications specialist based at Long Bin Base, about an hour from Saigon. After the events of the previous few days, the trip was thankfully uneventful, and once again, Donahue's old drinking buddy was astonished to see him. Afterwards, Donahue returned to Saigon, but the next day, a VC sapper squad detonated the tons of explosives stored at Long Bin, sending a fireball shooting into the sky so large, Donahue saw it in Saigon, some 20 miles away. Returning, Donahue found Pappas unharmed. Saying his final goodbyes, Donahue returned once more to Saigon, dodging mortar shells on the way. After spending approximately four months in Vietnam, Donahue was able to secure passage on board a ship bound for the U.S., landing in Seattle before taking a flight to New York. During his journey, he had found four of the six men on his list. Of the two others, Marine Second Lieutenant Richard Reynolds Jr. had been killed in action near Dong Ha the day after Donahue arrived in Vietnam. The other man, Joy McFadden, had been sent home after contracting malaria. Of the four men Donahue did find, Rick Dugan, Tommy Collins, Kevin McLoon, and Bobby Pappas all made it home to the U.S. What was told for 50 years as a barroom tall tale was turned into a book in 2017. It was made into a feature film in 2022, starring Zac Efron, Bill Murray, and Russell Crowe. According to a newspaper report, the five men still occasionally meet up for dinner in New York.